Um, I promised, maybe foolishly, to cover a rather large topic, as you can see, the Action T4 or the T4 program and other euthanasia crimes in World War II Austria. And uh, since there are only about 15 minutes, and we've been told repeatedly and sternly that the uh, time discipline will be enforced, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to uh, limit myself to highlighting specific differences be between Germany and Austria. So I think it is safe to assume that, okay, we're also now safe from viruses. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do not want to run this app. Um, I think it is safe to assume that all of you are more familiar, or most of you, are more familiar with the German case. And uh, so I, yeah, I will focus on the specificities of uh, Austria. And uh, I think the most important difference between Germany and Austria when it comes to the implementation of the race hygiene program concerns the time frame or the chronology of events. If you look at the developments in Germany alone, we can distinguish something like a pattern of increasing radicalization from the implementation of the four sterilizations in 1934, the, the implementation or yeah, implementation of uh, eugenic forced abortions in 1935, uh, the preparations in 1939 uh, for the murder of uh, children with handicapped in special clinics, the Kinderfachabteilungen, and then to the mass extermination of adult psychiatric patients, mostly adult psychiatric patients, in the gas chambers of uh, Aktion T4. In Austria, of course, what happens is that all of these policies are implemented basically at the same time, nearly simultaneously, in the years 1939 and 1940. There was no such pattern of an increasing uh, radicalization or escalation as in Germany. In Germany, if you take the sterilization law, for example, uh, it, had, it had come into effect within 11 months of the Nazis taking over uh, at the beginning of 1934. In Austria, despite the fact that the Nazis, of course, were already in, the, in full control of the state apparatus, the same process, I mean, it was not exactly the same process, but the, the implementation of the law took nearly two years. It took nearly two years from the annexation of Austria until the sterilization law came into effect in January 1940 in the Ostmark. So it seems that the steriliz st sterilization policies were not of a very high priority in Austria. This is also reflected by the fact uh, that the number of proceedings before the, the hereditary health courts, so the special courts that were um, created uh, for the to, to, to carry out the decisions about forced sterilizations, that the number of these proceedings was much smaller than in Germany. If we compare this proportionally to the population, we are talking about uh, roughly a fifth of the cases in Germany. So this is a quite a disparity, I would say. The most plausible explanation for this is that with the beginning of the war, medical resources were already quite scarce. And this was one of the reasons uh, why the, the sterilization policy was uh, tuned down, something that we can, of course, also observe in Germany at the same time. The sterilizations were basically limited to what was considered the most urgent uh, cases. A second possible explanation for this is that the sterilization was in some way superseded by euthanasia. Um, this is a very tempting explanation on the one hand, but it also has its problems. Uh, mostly the, the, the biggest problem being that the target group of sterilization and euthanasia was not the same. There was a certain amount of overlap, but this was, these policies were clearly directed uh, at different uh, groups of people. Um, Nevertheless, it is important to note that there was a striking difference between the, let's say, slow, reluctant, uh, hesitant implementation of forced sterilizations in Austria and the very rapid, or fast and radical implementation of the euthanasia campaigns. And this is now, of course, the topic of my talk. One indicator of this radicality, which I would postulate, is the disproportionately high number of Austrian victims uh, during the T4 campaign. Of the six uh, killing centers, they are known to you, I, I suppose, that were operated by T4. There was one that was established in Austria. This was Hartem Castle near Linz. And this is my first slide. 
make a big bet here. This is yeah, an iconic photo uh, taken in secret of Hartheim Castle with the uh, crematorium in operation, taken by Karl Schumann in 1940. There's also another more full view of the, the castle. Also, this dates a bit from a bit after 1945. Hartheim was the T4 killing center that was uh, in operation for the longest period of time among the six uh, killing centers. And the first gassings there took uh, place in May 1940. And that, again, it was several months before the first four sterilizations were carried out in Vienna. This uh, happened probably in the fall of 1940. So gassing on a mass, one could say pre-industrial scale, in hard time already a month before the first person actually underwent surgery for sterilization. Hartheim also accounted for more than a quarter of the total of all T4 victims, um, with 18,000 killed until August 1940 alone. That is to say the time span that refers to the T4 operation uh, proper in the uh, narrow sense. If we compare the number <coughs> of deaths in within the catchment area of Hartheim, which is not exactly uh, the, the former or later Austria, it comprised also areas of southern Bavaria and in other annexed territories, but roughly if we compare the, the catchment area and the population there, uh, we can see that the number of deaths within hard times area, so to speak, uh, is much higher than in Germany. In Germany, without the Austrian territories, roughly one person out of every 1,280 inhabitants was killed during T4. One out of 1,280. The same figure for Austria is one out of every 500, or 2.6 times higher. So there's a much higher uh, proportion of euthanasia victims in Austria. It's too early. There are several factors that can help explain this disparity. Uh, first of all, and this is a, a little uh, disclaimer, we also see similar disparities between various regions uh, in Germany. Uh, to a certain extent, this uh, is due to the fact that the campaign was stopped in, in August 1941 in a rather abrupt manner, and that one could say that the killers in some regions, they had achieved their goals, whereas in others they had hardly began. So this is one explanation for uh, regional disparities like this one. But there are also structural features that set Austria apart, or set Austrian psychiatry apart. And one of these features is the fact that mental patients were concentrated in very large institutions. Uh, okay, now we see the map. These are the principal institutions or psychiatric hospitals from which uh, victims were deported uh, to Hartheim. And we can see Hartheim Castle yeah, in the upper left, not quite corner, this is Upper Austria near Linz, uh, Hartheim, and Vienna, of course, in the far east of Austria with the biggest uh, and most important uh, psychiatric hospital, Steinhof, uh, which was mentioned yesterday in uh, Lisa Grünberg's touching account of the fate of her aunt uh, Peppi, if you remember, for those who were here. Uh, this is an aerial view of Steinhof. No, this is Feldhof, I'm sorry. This is Steinhof, about three quarters of the, um, of the premises centering on the Otto Wagner's uh, church built in 1907 and Steinhof in 1939 um, held no less than 4,300 patients. It was the largest institution of its kind in all of Central Europe. Uh, there were other institutions as well in Austria that were smaller but still held thousands of patients. And this is uh, Feldhof uh, in Styria near Graz. The patients in these institutions were exposed without any defense, and certainly the medical doctors and nurses uh, did not defend them, uh, to the assault of the euthanasia apparatus <coughs> in 1940, in 1941. They were yeah, ready to be uh, picked for, for killing or to, for deportation. In some institutions, <coughs> the toll, um, no, sorry, in Austria, if you take all of the institutions uh, how they were affected by, by T4, we can see that the staggering 62% of all patients were deported and killed during T4. So more than 6 out of 10 patients uh, were already gassed in this first sweep of, of deportations 
that was T4 within a span of barely 18 months. In some institutions, the toll was even higher. There's Novo Celle or Noi Chile in a next low asteria, which lost over 90% of its patients. Uh, and certainly, it also a factor played a role that uh, many of the patients there were considered also uh, racially of an inferior value, since this was a, a Slovenian uh, institution. In Ips in Lower Austria, a death toll of 83%. In um, Klagenfurt in Carinthia, also over 80%. From Vienna Steinhof, so the, the largest institution that I've mentioned, two thirds of its 4,300 patients were deported and killed. <coughs> um, there's another factor that is important to consider here. As research on T4 has shown already um, some, some time ago uh, by now, the most important criterion for the selection process was economy was the, the productivity, I mean the ability to perform productive work or the expectation that someone would still be able uh, to perform productive <coughs> work in the future. And what is interesting is that we can see that between the different uh, killing centers of T4, there are huge disparities in the application of this criterion. Um, notably, if you take the victims of at Sonnenstein, we have 37% that were described as not working or unproductive, 37%. It's considerable, but it's still much lower than in hard time, where 60% of the victims were described as economically unproductive. So a huge uh, yeah, disparity in the application of this economic uh, selection criteria. There's another area of Nazi medical crimes uh, where a relatively more radical approach uh, was taken in Austria. And this is the so-called uh, child euthanasia program. In Vienna, there was a dedicated facility uh, for the murder of children with disabilities that was created in 1940, in the early summer of 1940. And it was the second of uh, around 30 of such um, installations to be established. And it would by itself account for a sixth of all the victims in the, in the whole of Germany, if we accept which I do only with certain reservations, but if you accept uh, the commonly accepted death toll of 5,000 victims for the child euthanasia program. This institution is of course um, am Spiegelgrund, which many of you have known, have, have heard about. And I have here a picture from inside Steinhof. This is before Spiegelgrund was established, but it's the same Steinhof hospital. Uh, this was taken in December 1938, you can see the Adventkranz that indicates the, the, the season of the year. This was taken by uh, Hitler's personal photographer Heinrich Hoffmann who had a, a studio in Vienna and um, who produced yeah, a whole series of pictures fr from Steinhof patients uh, for propaganda purposes. So Spiegelgrund, as I've mentioned, was established <coughs> in the early summer of 1940 after the majority of Steinhof patients had been deported to Hartheim, leaving many of the hospital pavilions empty. So this is a map of uh, Steinhof. Again, it shows you the, yeah, the expanse of, of these premises, dozens of pavilions. Um, I don't have a pointer here, but you can see that one section is in this red uh, frame. This refers to the Spiegelgrund uh, institution, about uh, nine uh, pavilions that were repurposed after the killing of more than 3,000 patients from Steinhof uh, in order to facilitate the assessment, screening and selection of children and youth from the whole area of Vienna and the surrounding provinces. For psychiatric patients, uh, this development, uh, namely the creation of Spiegelgrund, meant that despite the radically reduced number of patients, the condition would soon worsen to the point where significant increases in mortality resulted. Uh, mortality from starvation, neglect, cold, and also from infectious diseases that were often <coughs> willfully promoted by concentrating patients in certain pavilions, so turning the idea of quarantine into a death trap, basically, for patients. In all, are you saying I've talked 15 minutes? Yes. I find it hard to believe, but I, I'll be fast. In all, approximately, you don't, you're bored. 
3,500 patients died, additionally to the victims I've already mentioned, under these conditions between 1941 and, the, and late 1945, in what is commonly called a decentralized or regionalized euthanasia. In other institutions, for example in Lower Austria and in Carinthia, some doctors would go even further and directly kill patients with various uh, means, including drug overdoses and electricity. And uh, there are two particularly striking examples for this, the hospitals of Mauer, Oehling and Kuking, um, which I also have on a, on a photo. This is Kuking, which now ho um, houses a very high-grade uh, research facility in Austria. Uh, it's a few minutes from Vienna. And in this hospital, Dr. Emil Gelny uh, modified a device for, for the application of electroconvulsive therapy to kill patients. A very yeah, an outstanding uh, way of turning medical technology into a killing technology. The Steinhof Hospital, and this is the last point I would like to mention in my presentation, also played an important uh, role in the extermination of Jewish patients. The hospital was used to concentrate all Jewish psychiatric uh, patients from all over Austria in order to facilitate their selection and later deportation. And from the Steinhof Hospital alone, around 400 Jewish patients were deported to Hartheim and killed under the T4 program, which means that they figured among the first uh, victims of the Holocaust under this umbrella of medical killing. Um, yeah, there's a whole paper on this topic on, on Jewish mental patients right after this one, so I'm, I'm not going to elaborate on this. I just want to close my presentation by mentioning one victim uh, who suffered this fate, uh, who, was, who managed to escape the T4 selections in the hospital uh, Steinhof, but who was then uh, deported uh, to Theresienstadt. Uh, and I'm, I'm speaking of the daughter of Theodor Herzl, Margarete uh, Neumann. She had been a, a patient in a private sanatorium for many years before being transferred to Steinhof in March 1941, which was before T4 ended, but it was after most of the, uh, the big waves of, of deportation uh, had happened, which helped her to, to survive uh, this phase. In August 1941, uh, she was deported with her husband to Theresienstadt, where she died uh, less than a year later. Um, and with this, I close, and I thank you for your patience. We have time for one question. Oh, this is really